A few days ago, I shared with you some of the things that I love about covering the world of clean cars and green energy. Don't worry, if you haven't seen it yet, you can watch it here and I'll leave a link in the description below. Today though, we're going to do the opposite, telling you some of the things that really rub me up the wrong way when it comes to electric vehicles and clean energy. And while I am using the term I hate for some of this video, I think for the majority of these niggles, it's true of the whole team. So buckle up, because this one is going to be everything that frustrates me and most of the team when it comes to covering EVs and clean energy. Please don't be cross. Like I did for this video's twin, I'm going to split this video into two distinct segments, things and people. But first I'm going to remind you that if you're in love with what we do here, we would really appreciate it if you'd consider supporting us with a Patreon membership or a YouTube channel subscription, because we only work with advertisers and products we actually use and value. We make far less from in-stream ads than most channels, so we rely more heavily on the support of you guys in our audience. So follow the link below and help us continue to make great content. Thanks. All right, so if you watched the last video, you will know that I am very much an introvert. And while I love the experience of traveling to new places, I don't always enjoy the process of getting there. Driving is just peachy most of the time, but I really hate being away from home. And even more, I really do not like dealing with the TSA for multiple reasons I'm about to share. For those who don't know, I have a rare genetic heart condition called Long QT syndrome or LQTS for short. Many people in my family actually have it, and some of them have needed to have implanted cardiac devices to shock their hearts if their heart develops a dangerous heart rhythm. It's something that's associated with this condition. I luckily do not have an implanted defibrillator. I have a heart monitor instead, but I have been advised to carry an external defibrillator with me when I'm traveling because... A lot of the ones in public places don't work and something could happen. Especially since normally when you're dehydrated, it increases your risk of something bad happening. And it's one of those conditions where a cardiac arrest is a possibility, but generally doctors no longer give patients implanted defibrillators because it's quite invasive unless they actually have a cardiac arrest. Don't ask me. I am not a doctor. Anyway, it leads to that when I fly, I have to carry an AED, that's automatic external defibrillator with me. And let's just say that some TSA professionals do not like that fact and usually treat it like it is a um, BOMB. They've broken it once and pretty much every time I travel to an EV event by air, I am pulled over for extra screening, despite the fact that I am a TSA pre-known traveller. As a consequence of being pulled over, I'm very often misgendered through TSA, so yeah, that sucks. And I know this isn't exactly a thing about covering EVs, but at the same time it's part of my job, and I'm kind of telling you all the sucky bits of my job. And while I love the actual flying bit, especially as these days I have enough air miles to often get upgraded, the whole process of going to film at a press launch event can be very stressful, especially as we often don't get a whole lot of time with said vehicle. Take the recent Volkswagen ID bus event earlier this year in California. I think that Michael and I ended up with about 10 minutes to film with the vehicle, and that puts pressure on everyone. When we went to film the Chevrolet Silverado EV a few years ago, I think we had maybe 10 or 20 minutes with the vehicle and getting time with the vehicle was actually worth the trip because we got exclusive access to it. But well, you always end up going away for an event like that going, ah, I wish I had said this or that, or why didn't we film this thing? The next thing I really hate about big press launches and events is the inordinate amount of hobnobbing that you are expected to do. If you have watched this video's twin, 
You'll also know that in addition to being an introvert, I don't like large groups and big launch events have plenty of large groups of large numbers of people. You know, if it's a sit down evening meal with engineers and a few other automotive journalists, I have a great time. But if it's a massive launch event with a Buffy style food, a bar and loud music, which it very often is, no thanks. As a side, my favourite press launches are the smaller ones where there's just a few journalists and everyone gets a car and several uninterrupted hours with the vehicle. They really often rock a lot. So while I'm on the subject of press launches, I want to let you in on a little secret. When a mainstream automaker invites us on a press launch, it's generally a pretty good experience overall, even if the aforementioned Buffy style bar GJ thing exists. But when it's a startup or an unknown company, that is not always the case. Which brings me to the matter of uninformed PR folks. Dealing with PR folks is one of the worst parts of this job. And while a good PR person can make an event a breeze, a poorly informed PR person who's often just been hired in for an event can make said event a challenge, especially if they don't know anything about cars. I've spent days talking back and forth with the PR person who just wants the channel to come and film an event, but who similarly wants to micromanage our experience to the point we would lose all editorial impartiality if we actually went. And at the same time, I've attended launches and interviews where the PR team has done little to no prep. And the whole thing is a metaphorical car crash covering the industry as long as I have. I'm pretty used to it by now, but Michael does prefer having an idea of what's going on and it irritates him beyond belief when he asks me what's happening and I reply with a... Uh. Before I get to the people though, let's also throw a bone to the way in which many automakers appear to have spent little to no time figuring out how the regular car buyer will buy, interact, and use their vehicle. These days, they spend a lot of time and energy on focus groups coming up with a target buyer, which to be frank, all seems to be affluent educated sorts. And that leads to some pretty horrible expectations from marketing teams and pretty terrible messaging for potential customers. And all of that leads to some pretty terrible corporate decisions on the part of automakers, ranging from promising models that never actually happen to charging customers extras for things that should be standard, or in the case of recalls, failing to give a straightforward answer when asked a basic question. This can all lead to confusion. It can lead to overpriced cars with features that average buyers simply don't want or care about, and can lead to a great amount of disparity in the marketplace when it comes to equitable access to cleaner, greener transportation and energy. I know, I sound like a broken record. So let's switch to the people. And I'm going to be blunt here. While the majority of people I meet in this job are lovely, there are a few who just do not vibe with myself or the rest of the team. Sometimes they're journalists, sometimes they're not, but they're usually very, very avid fans of a particular car or automaker or fuel type. And they tend to have an exclusionary attitude towards any other automaker or owner of a car that isn't their favorite or a particular fuel type. Not only will they quite happily comment in editorials, on YouTube videos and other forums, but they'll quite vociferously jump on anything that portrays rival firms in a negative light. The reality though, most automakers, legacy and startup have points where they behave despicably and then moments when they are pretty amazing. And when I meet people who are dyed in the wool on their opinions, it is very difficult to have a conversation with them. And no, to be clear, I'm not just talking exclusively about Tesla fans. I meet people who are ardent supporters of other EV only brands like Lucid and Rivian, as well as people who feel the same way about a particular legacy automaker EV like a Nissan Leaf or Chevrolet Bolt EV. I'm talking about tribalism and of course it's part of the human condition if we let it, but sadly too many people let it. The problem though is that when we do encounter tribalism, 
we're more likely to encounter people who aren't willing to acknowledge that there's usually some middle ground with every car company and every option, every charging network and every governmental policy. At the end of the day, I think it's important for us in the industry to go, hey, another EV, that's good, rather than, oh, you are a terrible person, you purchased the wrong car. Closely followed by this and my level of hate is the amount of sheer misinformation perpetuated about electric vehicles, either from poorly written articles from mainstream media and sources who are clearly trying to spread FUD, that's fear, uncertainty and doubt, among their audience. We've had to deal with some humdingers on this channel before, but when someone who is acting like an internet troll gets in line with some terrible conspiracy theory or debunked urban myth about EVs, our patience wears thin. And that in turn brings me to another big hate, the comments section, and the random hate we get sent our way because freedom of speech. And look, I personally will acknowledge I have an issue with those who conflate freedom of speech with permission to hate on folks, and it's pretty common in my experience, especially when tied together with homophobia, transphobia, and hatred of anyone who believes a particular political party line. It's those people and the hate they spew that make me question my job on a definitely weekly and sometimes daily basis, and it's those people I wish I could get through to the most. I want to just put them behind the wheel of an EV. I want to get them experiencing life as someone else or through someone else's eyes. I want to get them being compassionate because at the end of the day, they are humans too. And frankly, hatred normally comes from a place of pain. Which brings me to my number one bugbear about this industry. And it's more a YouTuber thing than an industry thing. The number of people who want to sell you something, have you review something for money, or want to pee back off the success of the channel to make a quick buck. And the games you have to play to get certain editorial opportunities. Our inbox is regularly filled with requests to work with us on things. Often from a Chinese PR firm working for some company we've never heard of who wants us to produce a scripted video of their product. We'll say no only to be pinged a few days later, sometimes the same day. And sometimes they'll even reach out to us via social media on our personal accounts, which is something no one on the team likes. And that beyond anything else just gets me so frustrated. While some people identify as influencers in this space and have been very successful by being open and honest about that fact and good on them, there are also some who blur the lines and change their opinion based on who's paying the bill and what doors that bill opens for them. And frankly, that makes it really hard for some audience members to figure out what people really think. And it makes it hard for us and others who are being upfront about their business relationships to be treated fairly. But even though I know this video is longer than the like one. At the end of the day, I like this job, or at least I like its goal. I hate it when I get things wrong, but hey, it's only human to make mistakes and I make sure that we do our best to let you know when we screw up. I hate it when we have to work long hours, but we're getting better at that. And I hate that sometimes we don't get to make the kinds of videos we really want to because we also are tied in to the mighty algorithm just as much as every other online creator. Luckily though, the good tends to cancel the bad out. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note below. You can reach out to us in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you are a Patreon supporter in the comments section there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links below to regularly support us with the YouTube membership Patreon subscription, or reach out to us using Ko-fi, Bitcoin and our swag store. You'll also find links below to our Mastodon, as well as our Peertube, which is a great way of watching our videos if you do not want to watch them here on YouTube. 
Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing Charged Up supporters and shout outs go out to our Vita G Patreon supporters. They are Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C. Hey Esker, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Ray Jean Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Teslit and the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Asenta, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlal, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off grid supporters Paul Conway, Kevin Burrabridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fager. Back, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris Anna, Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Jobnack, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on this channel. Plus, on a Sunday, you'll find us on Take Two for our chicken and garden update and Sunday musing. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. So in the video on things we liked about this job, I talked a little bit about one of our oldest Macs that we have, the, the Mac 2E that lives downstairs in the family room. Today, I'm going to tell you about two Macs that you may have seen if you've seen photographs of our server room. And that are, our, those are even our X serves. We have an X serve 2,1 and an X serve 3,1 from 2008 and 2009 respectively. They sit in our server cabinet. We have both of them running. They're both running macOS 10 Ventura, the latest macOS uh, version, at least for another few weeks until the new operating system comes out. And we use one of them as our kind of family junker machine if we want to do a piece of, of, of work on a machine that, that's not connected to our work machines. We can just VPN into that, um, or not VPN, we can just uh, remote desktop in and do what we need to do and um, nothing kind of gets left on our work machine. But also uh, the other one is going to become a backup for the Transport Evolved server with a tape drive and everything else. We've got new graphics cards, WX 4100s in them. We have Firewire cards running in them. And because they're rack mounted servers, they just slot into the rack, the room is air conditioned and they're just doing their thing. They're just working just fine. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, wow, you still have machines that, what, 15 years later are still running the latest operating system and still running happily. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, waste not, want not. Keep those machines running until they break. Try and keep things running. Only replace them when you absolutely need to, not when it's just because it's a new hotness. <laughs> 